Looking for Brother Aaron to preach. We love Brother Aaron Green. Love you. Stand. Sing with us. To Cain's land where the soul never died. Sing it right now. To Cain's land. I'm on my way where the soul never died. I've told you before, we got from uh, Chris and them way back up in the country. If you've ever been up there in the little storefront church, and they'd sing the top of their voice and bless me all over. There's a roof up above me. Sweet food on. Get another over here. I 
unbound smile. son-in-law, DJ Pappas. Do you know DJ? He sits down here. He's a neat guy. He's, he, he doesn't fit in the family too much because he's quiet and <laughs> nice. But uh, we love him. I'm going to embarrass him and ask him to pray for the offering. What do you say, boys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please hold your applause. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good to be in God's house, and I'm glad I get to, to sing with my fellas here. I love these boys, and I'm proud of them. They, I, I have respect for them. I thank God for that. I do, I do. How about a good song, fellas? Tell me something. Do, do Rogers. There are people wondering what we did there. What do you listen here? The kid got it. What key are you in? She said, Is that a good key? There are people who are whispering and the rumors are running wild. They Thank 
Good story, isn't it? A good story. Been thankful all day. Old buddy Ruiz talked to Karina, the young lady that helps take care of and Miss Lynn didn't do and just helped around over there and won her to the Lord. Kept talking to her and talking to her. Listen, do you know what that means? You just it's just amazing what that means and, and it's uh, it makes you feel really good to be a part of that. And I'm glad for our good people. You know, I love, uh, uh, this is my people, as old brother Bill would say, this is my crowd. And so i um, glad to be a part of it, just a little part. But I'm thankful that I've been able to be here. Me and my sweet family raised him. Ronnie wasn't even born, and Jeff was, Jeff was six weeks old when he came here. Heather, Heather wasn't even thought of. And so <laughs> and, uh, I had a lot less wrinkles. and. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> but God's good. He's good to us, and we we've, we've been privileged to do what we what we can do, what little bit we can do. Ain't God good? Are you happy in the Lord? And I say again, these are the best folks. Um, uh, if I ever had problems, and in uh, uh, I'd want to be right in the middle of this bunch here. So thank God for you. All right, tell me something. How about I believe it in the church in about a D or something like that, honey? Is that good? Sure. I believe it in the church today. We've grown accustomed to the lack of praise. And I'm afraid we think it's supposed to be that way. But I'm here to tell you I believe that's not the way it has to be. Because when I think of all the Lord has done for you and me, well, Somebody ought to sing, man. Somebody ought to lift their hands. Somebody ought to stand and shout that they are glad they're born again. Somebody ought to shed a tear. Thank the Lord that they're here. Somebody ought to. 
be Well, my friend, it's gonna have to start with you and me Need to stop all of this looking around Waited for someone else to make a sound Because if Jesus saved your soul Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody, Somebody ought to lift, lift their, their hands. Hand. Somebody ought to stand and shout that they are glad they're born again. Somebody ought to shed a tear. Thank the Lord that they are here. Somebody ought to come to this soul altar while the Lord is near. And the Lord, I I do, I got that little high. That's the sing, that's the key that Hoy sings it in. So, as I tell you. Hi, all right, thank you. Thank you. I was afraid you wouldn't ask. <laughs> I mentioned a lot of times 25 little verses in the sweetest, sweetest book that ever was. And do you know that uh, the Apostle Paul is in prison? Old Onesimus comes by and says, Paul, I've made a mess out of things. He lived all the way over in Colossae, in, in modern-day Turkey. Had stolen, apparently stolen, and run away. And Onesimus came to Paul and said, Paul, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Onesimus is a, or Philemon is a Christian man, and I've wronged him. And so <laughs> he repented, and he wanted to go back and take something. A slave probably didn't have anything. But the Apostle Paul wrote him a letter, wrote him a letter and said, you take this and you tell today that Philemon even owed Paul for his salvation. But he said, look, if he owes you, if he has wronged you or oweth thee aught, I, I, Paul, will repay. Put that on my account. We that were debtors and are debtors, thank God he gave us life, gave us a, what about a good way? When I, I like to talk to people about Jesus, about living for the Lord. And I've been a Christian for 70 years. I was eight years old when I gave my heart to the Lord. I know I should be more along, further along. But, you know, I can, I can look people in the face and say, you know, to serve him, serve him first, put him first. And what I always say, and Sister Odell will say, seek the first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and... <laughs> yes! Yes, you want a positive life? You want, give him your heart. As a kid, do it as a child. Yeah, I tell my grandkids, thank you, Lord. All right, children, you got to help me out. Amen, amen. The old apostle under house arrest began to write a message on behalf of one. Surely deserve to die. Onesimus had stolen from his Lord and run away. But Paul led him to Jesus and now had come the day that he would return to Philemon's house and right the wrong he had done with letters. It's time to go now, my son. With trembling fear, the journey of Onesimus began. He knew the faith that he deserved for the wrong he had done to this man. At last he arrived and stood before the one whose mercy he pled. He felt that it would be read by Lehman took the letter and the writing he recognized when opened up this was the message 
found lovingly inscribed I know that he's wrong to and run away I know he's unworthy to live But oh finally on my behalf I'm asking you to forgive Receive him as myself today He's profitable now to me Regardless of the amount I promise today to you I'll repay Put that on my account Now there's another intercession Story I should tell You see, it explains How I was rescued from a devil I stood before the King of Glory, guilty of the crimes that Satan had reminded God I committed so many times. Oh, but the one who sat at God's right hand stood up and he made this decree and from his lips the sweetest request was made in behalf of me. I know that he's sinful and often fails. I know he's unworthy to live. But oh, my Father, on my behalf, I'm asking you to forgive. Receive him into your house today, for he belongs now to me. His way was provided through the finished work at Calvary. And his debt was all paid some wonderful day. Oh, and he knelt neat the blood flowing fount. So take all the wrong that he has done. Put that on my account. You can take all the wrong. Brother Aaron Howard, we thank God for him. And Sister Bree, he's a good preacher, a good man, a great leader, and we love him. We appreciate him. Well, it's good to be in God's house, amen. Yes, sir. I'm not going to lie to you, I was getting a little comfortable there. I was ready for them to just sing the whole service, man. <laughs> we were in for a treat. Uh, but it is good to be with you this evening. And if I look a little bit redder than normal, it's because I have already received, uh, received my first sunburn of the season. And if I keep up this pace, I'll probably, uh, I'll probably go for a new record for myself at this rate. So <laughs> I'll tell you what, the weather in Tampa, Florida, there ain't nothing like it, man. We go from 60 degrees in the morning to about 85 in the evening, and uh, that's just a different animal. But it is truly good to be with you tonight, and uh, I want to give you a brief update on the youth group, and I, I want to give you something to pray about that's near and dear to my heart right now. Uh, of, of course, things are just going fantastic in the Wilson Center. Uh, we were finally able to break that ceiling, and we had 80 students this past uh, Wednesday. So that was, a, that was a blessing and thrilled about that. But let me give you something to pray about. Um, we have a young man who is wrestling with possibly answering the call to preach. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to pray for him. And we, we've set up some opportunities for him in, in the coming days uh, to, to kind of test the waters, so to speak. So I would encourage you, please pray with him, pray for him about this. Uh, it, it would be excellent to have another young person answer the call to ministry in our youth group. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled to open up God's Word with you tonight. If you have your Bibles, uh, Jonah chapter 2 is where we're going to spend our time. Uh, turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament prophet, uh, the book of Jonah, chapter number 2. And if you didn't know this, the book of Jonah is only four, four chapters. Uh, and each chapter has its own unique division. Of course, the first chapter is all about uh, God's call to Jonah to go share a prophecy with the people of Nineveh. Jonah runs, and he gets on a ship headed towards Tarshish, which is, uh, of course, the opposite way from Nineveh, literally the complete opposite direction from there. 
He, uh, God quite literally hurls a storm at Jonah. And Jonah, through a process of events, reveals that he is a prophet, uh, gets thrown into the sea, and then as he is sinking towards the depths, God sends a great fish. And I, I love, I love how chapter one puts it. It tells us that God prepares a great fish. And that great fish comes and swallows up Jonah. And Jonah chapter 2, which is where we're going to spend our time this evening, is really all about Jonah in the belly of the fish. If anything, it's really Jonah's prayer in the fish. Uh, Jonah 2 is really just a prayer from Jonah as he's sitting in the fish, and it's a prayer of, oddly enough, thanksgiving. And I, I want to take our time as we walk through this passage, and I, I, I really want to uh, give it some depth. So I'm going to encourage you, just keep your Bible open. We're going to walk verse by verse as we navigate the text. I'm going to give you some truths along the way, and I want to wrap it up by giving you three simple thoughts. In Jonah chapter 2, verse number 1, notice what the Bible says. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the belly of the fish. I, what I love about this is it literally opens up with the contrast of the first chapter. In Jonah 1, Jonah never prays. When you read the first chapter of Jonah, when he receives the call of God, when he's running from God, when he's going down to Tarshish, when he's headed on the boat towards Joppa, Jonah never prays, but when he gets to the belly of the fish, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. then he decides to pray. Right. There's a sharp contrast in the character of Jonah. And I, I want you to see Jonah uh, chapter 2, verse 2. It, it says, And I said, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I. Now heard is my voice. Jonah 2, 2, whenever it refers to hell here, it refers to a Hebrew word known as Sheol. And Sheol refers to the grave divine punishment. And it's the deepest depths where there is no deliverance apart from God. In this whole section we're reading from verses 2 to verse 7, it is a prayer, but it's really Jonah recounting the events as he is sinking to the bottom of the sea. I'm going to hit this point a little bit later as well, but one great truth we get from this is that God will hear us wherever and whenever we pray. Yeah. Just as Jonah learned in chapter 1, he cannot outrun God, he also learns that there is no place that he can go where God will not hear him. And there's a great truth and a great reminder for, that, for us in that. Notice what verse 3 says. For thou hast cast me into the deep, and the midst of the seas and the floods can pass me about all thy billows... And thy waves overcame me. And notice how Jonah recognizes that God's the one who had cast him into the sea. And Jonah recognizes that God is the one who sends the waves and the billows towards him. Jonah learns a great truth here. That God is in control over all things. One of the great things we learn in the book of Jonah is that God is in control over everything. He is sovereign over all. He is sovereign over the great fish. And he is sovereign over the caterpillar. He's sovereign over all things. Verse 4. Then said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. I love this. Jonah realizes he's out of the will of God. He's been put out of God's favor from his own rebellion. And as he is sinking to the bottom of the ocean, notice this, he makes a conscious decision and choice to look towards God. Remember, this is the first time in the entire book of Jonah he has ever done anything like this. The entire first chapter is all about him getting away from God. It's all about him running from God. He doesn't even want to look towards God. Yeah. But as he sinks to the bottom of the sea, he makes a deliberate decision to look towards God. Can I give you this truth? God will allow us to sink so we can, so we can see how much we need him. God will allow us to sink so we can see how much we need him. Sometimes God will allow us to go through difficulties. God will allow us to go trials, through trials. God will allow us to suffer the consequences of our actions. And as we're going to see in this next verse, God will allow us to look death face to face so we can see how much we need him. Notice verse 5. The waters can pass me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were trapped about my head. When we read this, Jonah is in a distinctively different position in verse 5 than he was in verse 3. In verse 3, Jonah is just now starting to sink in the ocean or in the sea. And in verse 5, Jonah has been completely submerged and begins to head to the depths. 
And I hope you're getting the mental image here. Please, please don't just read this as just some verses that are on the text. I, I, I want you to envision God's prophet, the big man on campus, the one who's always known for giving the good prophecies, has run away from God. He's been cast into the sea. He is literally sinking to the depths. And as he is sinking, the seaweed is wrapping around his head. The light is beginning to fade from his life. And he literally looks at the last moment towards the temple. And with one of his last breaths and one of his last moments, he prays to the Lord a simple prayer. God, deliver me. There's such beauty when we think of it like that. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. I, I, I love it because when he says this, when, when, when he references the bars of the earth, he is literally saying, I have hit rock bottom. Yeah. I, I, have, I have hit the bottom of the sea, and when I hit the bottom of the sea, I found that you are there with me. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. Verse 7 serves as the turning point in Jonah's descent. I, 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 I love this. Just as Jonah is about to lose that consciousness, just as the light is about to fade from his body, with one of his very last moments and thoughts, he just ushers that simple prayer and it goes right into the throne room of God. And God sends that great fish to grab him and deliver him. I love it because it tells us that God can and will answer our prayers regardless of our geographical location, regardless of how far we've ran. If we cry out to him, he will deliver us and he will save us. Verse eight. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. What we see in verse 8 is, 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 in a lot of ways, Jonah, he shifts from his experience sinking to the depths, and we get back into the belly of the fish. And he gives us some practical, uh, practical information and knowledge here. And, and, and I really want you to get this because it, it kind of seems out of place by every standard. When we read verse 8, you're kind of like, why is this here? What, 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 what is he talking about lying vanities? What's that have to do with anything? I, Jonah, you're, you're, you're in a fish. It's important. I, I, I love how another translation puts this. It says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. What Jonah is saying is those of you who put your faith and trust in idols, you're going to be disappointed because they're going to fail you every single time and you are going to miss out on God's mercy, love, and grace. Yeah. I, I, I feel like we always ask the question, what's an idol? What would be considered an idol? I like how Tim Keller puts it. He says, an idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. And whenever we put idols in our life, whether it's a job, whether it's a certain amount of money in the bank account, whether it's a piece of real estate or a piece of property, uh, maybe it's rising to a certain position of power. Whenever we put those idols in our lives, it takes us away from the very presence of God. In that day and age, if a Jewish person like Jonah were to worship an idol, it literally meant this. They are abandoning all their loyalty to God. You see, you're all in or you're all out. There's no, well, I can worship this and I can worship God. No, if you worship an idol, you have abandoned all loyalty to God. And can I give you this great truth? Idols break very easy in storms. Idols will break very easy in storms. Jonah knows this firsthand. Jonah chapter 1, remember, uh, God hurls the storm at him while he's on the ship. And the sailors, uh, who are literally pagans who worship false gods, what do they do? They grab their idols and throw them overboard, and nothing happens, and the storm rages on. Idols will break really easy in storms. And can I give you this reality? It doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. It doesn't matter how high you've climbed the corporate ladder. It doesn't matter how many cars you have to drive, how many properties you own. It doesn't matter how good you feel and how many friends you may have on Facebook. Hear me on this. Those things will not fix the storms of your life. Right. Yeah. Idols break very easy in storms, my friend. And Jonah learned that firsthand. Our idols cannot deliver us from the storms of life or the belly of the fish. Only God can. 
Notice verse 9. He says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. By the way, highlight, underline, circle the word thanksgiving there. I I, I love this. I'm going to get ahead of myself for just a second. Because it tells us the way in which Jonah prayed with thanksgiving. You can pray a lot of ways. But the best way to pray is with thanksgiving. Because a, thing, a thanksgiving prayer, a prayer that re- relies on thankfulness, prays with confidence. It's going to pray with assurance. It's going to pray with an open mind and an open reflection of what God is doing. And this verse, is, in essence, is Jonah rededicating his life here. He's saying, I am turning back to God. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And and he rededicates his life, and he's willing to do what God is calling him to do. And this is quite the turnaround for Jonah as he goes from running from God uh, as far as he possibly can to being thrown off a boat during a terrible storm, sinking to the bottom of the sea, being swallowed by a well, to now being willing to do what God has called him to do. The whole situation is what allows Jonah to proclaim this. Salvation comes from the Lord alone. This entire lesson, this entire moment, that everything with the fish... Or teaches him that salvation comes from God alone. And then we, we see Jonah's three-day, three-night stay, and the fish is over. Gets vomited back up on dry land, verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I, I, I'm not really sure what Jonah smelled like, but I've been around middle school boys after they've been in PE class, and I would wager it'd be very similar. The reality is this, the belly of the fish is not a glamorous place to live, but the belly of the fish is a great place to learn. The belly of the fish is not a glamorous place to live, but it is a great place to learn. Let me give you three truths about the belly of the fish. If you're wondering what the title of the message is, it's simply this purpose in the pit. Let me give you three purposes we see here. First and foremost, the belly of the fish was a place of provision. It's a place of provision. God uses the belly of the fish as a place to prepare and uh, provide for Jonah. Jonah was sinking to the bottom of the sea. He, He is on death's door. He is quite literally, as he describes it, the gates of the earth are about him. And God sends a fish to deliver him. I would wager this. When Jonah saw the fish, he did not see provision. He saw a death sentence. I would wager this, when Jonah saw the fish, he didn't say, oh, God is taking care of me. He says, God hates me. I think so often when we find ourselves in the belly of the fish, we have the wrong motive about it. I think we look at the belly of the fish as a terrible place to be, but we need to take the step back and understand that God has provided the belly of the fish because he loves us. And can I tell you this? If God actually hated Jonah, he would have drowned. If God really hated Jonah, he would have stayed at the depths of the sea. If God really hated Jonah, he would have never gotten a second chance. But hear me on this. The belly of the fish was a place of provision, and God provided it for Jonah as a way for him to stay safe in this. God will prepare and appoint times in our lives where we will be at rock bottom in the belly of the fish. And it may, be, it may feel miserable, and it may not be, we may not be where we want to be, but often we deserve so much worse. We have to remind ourselves that the belly of the fish is not God's judgment. It's God's salvation. And he has provided it for us to give us a second chance. So when you hit that rock at the bottom, just remind yourself you're hitting the rock of ages. When when you sink to the bottom, know that you're hitting the rock of ages that will provide for you and give you a second chance. The belly of the fish is a place of provision. Secondly, I want you to see this. The belly of the fish was a place of preparation. Not only... Did God provide it for Jonah, but God used it to prepare Jonah. Remember Jonah's heart in chapter 1? He hates the Ninevites. I, I, I know we love to paint this, paint this passage as a beautiful little children's story. And, and, I, and I, I was telling the teenagers when we went through this uh, series, I always remember like this little image of Jonah and whenever I was in Sunday school and it was Jonah sitting on the tongue of the, uh, the fish and there's this bonfire and he's just sitting there and that's how it's like, but that's not like it. This is a brutal story dealing with racism. Jonah hates these people. 
He doesn't want the Ninevites to be saved. He wants them dead. And when we see it in chapter 1, he is doing whatever he can to not give them salvation, to not give them a chance. His heart's in the wrong spot. His heart is going against it. He doesn't want them to know the Lord. God knew Jonah's heart was not right. God knew that Jonah was not in the proper spiritual condition to go and tell the people of Nineveh the message he had for them. So God uses the belly of the fish to make him ready. Before, before Jonah had went to the belly of the fish, he despised the thought of going to Nineveh. He hated the Ninevites. He was doing everything in his power to get away from God. Yet when he comes out of the belly of the fish, and we, we see this clearly in chapter 3, he is ready to go and minister to the Ninevites. Why? Because the belly of the fish was used by God to prepare Jonah's heart to go and do what he has called him to do. Yeah. How do we know it worked? You read it in verse 9. Verse 9, Jonah rededicates his life and says, salvation is of the Lord. We have to understand this. Whenever God places us in the belly of the fish, he does it to prepare us for what he is calling us to do. God allows us to go through difficulties, trials, and tests to prepare and mature us as believers. That's why James tells us in James 1, he says, count it all joy when you go through many different trials and temptations and tests. Because it is to perfect and mature and grow you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Let me make this statement to you and I'll move on. If you're not willing to spend time in the belly of the fish, then you're not going to receive the blessing of doing what God has called you to do. The belly of the fish was essential for Jonah because it prepares him to go and fulfill the calling he placed on his life. Thirdly, let me give you this truth. The belly of the fish was not only a place of provision, a place of preparation, it became a place of prayer. When, when we hit rock bottom, when we find ourselves in the belly of the fish, we're not supposed to try and pull ourselves up. And by the way, I understand we live in a culture where it's all about you trying to be a self-made man. It's all about you trying to build yourself up to a new standard, a new level, and you just got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But I want you to understand, when you find yourself in the belly of the fish, your job is not to pull yourself up. Your job is to make it a place of prayer. And cry out to the Lord. The best thing that Jonah could have done in the belly of the fish was pray. It was his prayer that ultimately got him out of the belly of the fish. And I would wager to say it was his prayer that prepared his heart and recognized that this was God's provision and him providing for Jonah. Everything in this chapter, it flows from Jonah's prayer to God. And we find ourselves in the belly of the fish. We should make it a place of prayer. I will say this, though. Isn't it sad this is what it took for Jonah to pray? Yeah. Remember. This is the first time in the entire book of Jonah that he prays. It took him finding himself in the belly of the fish. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this question. What's it take for you to pray? Does it take an incredibly difficult situation? Does it take it... Uh, you sinking to the depths of the, uh, the sea? Does it take you finding yourself in the belly of the fish? What does it take for you to pray? I believe we would all come to this point. We pray a lot more when life gets more difficult. Oftentimes we use prayer as a spare tire whenever, I, whenever we go flat. By the way, this shouldn't be the case. You understand if Jonah prayed to Joppa, this probably could have fixed everything. Yeah. Maybe if Jonah prayed when he first received the word from the Lord, it could have fixed his heart in the first place. Oftentimes we can avoid difficulties and trials if we would just pray in the first place but so often prayer becomes a last operation when it should be our first go-to move prayer should be a regular practice and conversation between us and god should not be a spare tire we pull out when life gets difficult thankfully we learned this though god will always hear us when we pray No matter how far away we get from him, no matter how far to the depths we go, no matter how difficult and how how ornery we may get, God will always hear us. I will give Jonah some credit, though. Remember, I told you to circle that word, thanksgiving, thankfulness. His prayer encompasses this. He is thankful for what the Lord is doing. When you have a heart of thankfulness when you pray, you will be able to look at the situations and the circumstance you're in and see God's hand upon it all. We can pray a lot of ways, but we truly see life, how God sees it, when we pray with thankfulness. Because we will understand that God is sovereignly in control and working everything out for his glory and for our good. 
And as we look through this prayer, Jonah prays with a thankful heart, and because of that, he's able to pray with a confident heart. He knew the Lord was going to take care of him. He knew the Lord was going to deliver him. He knew the Lord was going to work everything out for him. Let me ask you this question. I'll move to my final little thing here. When you pray, do you do it begrudgingly? Do you do it with frustration? Do you do it with a little bit of bitterness? Do you do it, let me give you a good one, with a little bit of a sense of entitlement that God should answer you? Or do you pray with a heart of thankfulness? Do you pray with a heart of confidence? Do you pray with a heart that truly believes that God is going to do and answer that request? Let me give this final little truth and we'll wrap it up. Jonah's prayer was filled with scripture. It's filled with scripture. The entire time Jonah is praying, I want you to understand this, he is just quoting scripture. Now remember this. He is in the belly of the fish. There's no bonfire he set up, okay? It's not like he walked in there and turned the light switch on. It is darkness. By the way, he doesn't have a copy of God's word with him. He, he didn't pull out his Bible app and scroll to his favorite verses. But I want you to understand how filled his prayer is, how, how, how much uh, scripture fills his prayer. Get this. He quotes from Psalm 3, Psalm 5, Psalm 18, Psalm 23, Psalm 30, Psalm 31, Psalm 42, Psalm 50, Psalm 69, Psalm 160, and Psalm 120. Every word, every word in the text of Jonah 2 some paraphrase, some summarize, some verbatim were taken from the Psalms. Every single word that Jonah prays is literally scripture. As Jonah is shrouded by darkness in the belly of the fish, this prophet of God begins quoting all the scripture he remembered and memorized as he prays to God. Jonah was able to cling to the truth of the word of God even if he couldn't physically see it. In the moments that you're in the belly of the fish and you're praying, what are your prayers rooted on? Are they rooted on something that sounds good? Or are they rooted on the word of God? When you pray, are you just floating something, something up in the air? Or, or have your prayers been grounded on the very word of God and the truth found in God's word? Is your prayer just a bunch of random thoughts strung together? Or is it words of faith rooted in the promises found in God's word? I would say this. It's very difficult to quote and mention scripture when you pray if you're not reading the Bible. Jonah may have ran away from God, but Jonah knew the word of God. And because he knew the word of God when he went, ran away from God, it was, help, it was able to help him get back to God. So how are you doing in reading the word of God? How, how are you doing in your devotional life? I, I emphasize this every chance I get with our teenagers. And I, I want to make it abundantly clear. You can do a lot of things but there is nothing more beneficial than spending time in the Word of God. Right. Nothing will grow you like the Word of God. Amen. Listen, you can, you can come to church services day in and day out. You can listen to worship music all the time. Man, you, man, you can hit the altar and pray from sun up to sundown. You, you, you can do all the good Christian things, but hear me on this. You will never truly grow as a believer in Jesus Christ until you're spending regular time in the Word of God. Amen. So how's your devotional life? How are you doing it? It's been, and by, by the way, can I throw this out? Church does not count. If church is your devotional life, then you are going to be an anemic Christian. If you're getting fed three times a week, you ain't going to have much to go on. And by the way, in your personal life, you wouldn't take three meals a week anyways. So why do you do it to your spiritual life? Ouch. That one probably hurts a little bit. The reality is, we may be healthy healthy individuals, but many of us are anemic Christians because we spend no time in God's word. Church doesn't count. You need to carve out time and spend it in the word of God. And guess what? When you do and you memorize the word of God, your prayers can be filled with the word of God. Jonah's were, and God heard him and delivered him. And so as we wrap this up, we see the purpose of the pit was it was to be a place of provision, it was to be a place of preparation, and it was to be a place of a prayer for Jonah to connect and express his thankfulness to God with the situation. You know what I love, though? God didn't leave Jonah in the pit. God didn't leave him just in the belly of the fish. Now, granted, he had to get thrown back up, 
By the way, when you run from God, don't be surprised when you smell like fish guts. He had to get thrown back up. But hear me on this. God gave him a second chance, and he was able to do what God called him to do. God has a purpose for you in the pit. God will not leave us in the pit or in the belly of the, of the fish. He will deliver us. I'll give you the story and I'll close. I remember probably the most distinct time I was in the pit uh, was nearly four years ago now, or over four years ago now, uh, when my mom passed away. And uh, that was an exceedingly difficult time for me. And if you've ever had a family member, and more specifically a parent pass away, uh, you understand how difficult that is. And and it wasn't like it was expected, it was out of the blue, and, and there's a wide range of emotions that I dealt with. And my wife can testify, I was not in the best spot for a while. And you, you, you go through the struggle of well, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? Where do I go from here? You go through the, the doubting of God and questioning God and wondering why God would do something like this. And, yeah. and, and, and by the way, it's okay to do that. Yeah. Just be ready for God to give you an answer. Just be ready for God to hit you with, where were you when I formed the stars? He did it to Job. And I remember I, I, I'm wrestling in the pit and, and And I had come to a point where I'd been fighting all these emotions. And I remember me and Bree were living at Southeastern at this time. And I went home from work and I just spent some time in the Word of God. And I I, I just felt like I needed to pray. And I I dropped to my knees and pray. And And it felt like for the first time in this entire process, I wasn't so concerned about asking God why and being angry and upset and frustrated. Instead, I came with a heart of thanksgiving. And I'm just going to be honest with you, the tears began to flow. And instead of getting upset for God taking my mom from me now, I was able to be be thankful for all the time he did give me with her. I was able to be thankful for her that she was a great woman of the Lord. I was able to be thankful that she prayed for me every day. I was able to be thankful for all that God had blessed me with. And I was able to recognize that God is sovereignly in control over all things. That he is working in my pit and he has a purpose for it. Even when I'm able to look back on that four years out, God had a plan. God had a purpose. I, I even think about it now, and, and as I'm in youth ministry, there's certain things that me and Bree can help others with because we've been in the pit. There's a beauty of it because God has a purpose for it. I genuinely believe that God used it to prepare my heart to minister to people and be the youth pastor here. There's a beauty in that. So let me say this to you, and we'll close. If you find yourself in the pit, and you will, it's going to happen. When you find yourself in the pit, know that it's a place of provision, it's a place of preparation, and it should be a place of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We begin to wrap the service up, and you're here this evening, and I've I've talked all about Jonah being in the pit, and you're sitting in your seat realizing, Pastor Aaron, I'm, I'm not in the pit. I'm on the path to hell. Pastor Aaron, I, I, I may not be in the pit, but I, I'm on my way to a devil's hell because I do not have faith or trust in Jesus Christ. You're here to Sunday night service and praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. But maybe you're in your seat and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you'd be willing to make that decision tonight. You'd be willing to put your faith and trust in Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. If that's a decision you'd be willing to make tonight, I just want to encourage you. Slip your hand in there so we can pray for you. Nobody's looking around. We won't embarrass you. We won't do anything like that. We just want to pray for you. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. You're here tonight and you'd be willing to say, Pastor, and I'm in the pit. Pastor, and I, I, I'm in the struggle. I'm going through a battle. I, I, I'm going through a war right now. Pastor, and I, I, want to find, I want to find God's purpose in the pit. Pastor, and I, I, I want to find some provision I I, I want to find preparation. I want to find prayer in this pit in my life. If that's a decision you've been willing to make tonight, I just want to encourage you to lift lift up your hand so we can pray for you. I don't want to embarrass you or do anything like that. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I'm going to close in prayer, and Ronald's going to sing us in a song, and these altars will be open. I want to encourage you, make any decision you need to make. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for the opportunity for us to open up your word. Lord, thank you for the truth we find in your word from Jonah. I'm thankful that you are working in all of us right now. 
I pray that you do a great thing in all of us and any decisions that are made tonight, let it be for your glory. We pray all this in your son's precious name. Amen. Stand please. Page 220. The love of God. The love of God. His great than tongue or pen could ever tell it goes beyond the highs and reaches to the lowest hell sing it love you seated uh, for a few moments I'd uh, just love to share a, a brief announcement with you this evening and uh, over the past couple of months the Lord has been uh, working in me and my wife's lives uh, privately and God has opened uh, some o opened some doors of opportunity for us and after much prayer and counsel and fasting uh, God has uh, going to be ushering us into a new season, a new chapter of life somewhere else. And w with that, we will be uh, stepping down uh, from being the youth pastor here in May. Um, we'll be stepping down from our positions of SCA as well. And, and the Lord has led us to a, a new place in uh, Greenville, North Carolina at Parker's Chapel Church, uh, serving as a student pastor there. And so if you ever see Gene Williams at a senior summit, you have full permission from me to punch him in the throat. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I want to tell you, uh, this is by far the most difficult decision we've ever had to make. Uh, we, we love y'all more than you could possibly understand. And, and I, I want to be abundantly clear, because I know when preachers make announcements like this, people love to speculate. I want to be abundantly clear with you. We're not upset. We're not frustrated. We're not angry. <laughs> There's no moral failure. <laughs> Truthfully, if you're asking me why, I couldn't tell you except the Lord has made it clear. And I think that's, that's the most difficult part. Um, the Lord has blessed our youth group and our church abundantly. He has blessed Brina and I abundantly. Uh, we, we have the best church family we could ever ask for. All I know is this, that this is the next step for us, and, and, and the Lord has provided a lot of peace uh, for that. And I, I told the teenagers this. Uh, we, we always tell them, you need to follow the Lord. You need to be obedient to God. You need to serve him. You need to go wherever he calls you to go. And I would be an absolute hypocrite if I were not obedient to him in this decision. And that would not be fair to them. I do know this, though. The Lord, the Lord is going to continue to bless this church. And right now, he is preparing the next person to take our place. And I promise you, the best is yet to come, and he's going to continue to take y'all to the next level. I, I'm thankful for what me and Bree were able to do out there, and, and, and we told the kids this, man. When we first got there, there was a whopping 15 of those suckers. And this, this past Wednesday, we had 80. And... Uh, We've seen students get saved. We've seen students baptized. We've seen 
students answer the call to ministry, make many, many, many life-changing decisions. Uh, but I know the Lord has more in store for them. And, and I told them this, and we may not have the title of youth pastor, but we're always going to be church family. Yeah. And I, 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 don't, I never want you to think of this as a separation of me and Bree from y'all. I just want you to view it as an extension. Because any good thing that happens at that youth group is because we had you guys pouring into us for the past three years of our lives. Any good thing that happens is because you all have poured into us in the process. And, and, and I know this is probably like the time where I need to thank a lot of people. And, and, and we, we took the time to do some of that privately, but uh, we love you all more than you know. And, and, and I cannot reiterate how how difficult a decision this was. And as much as we love y'all, we love the Lord more. And uh, we have to be obedient to him. And so here, here's what I'm asking you to do, okay? I'm going to ask you to pray for us. Please, please don't give us the cold shoulder. I'm going to ask that. We still love you. Pray for us as we begin to make this transition. I pray that God sends the right person. Pray that they're able to come here at the right time. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you see some teenagers, encourage them to be faithful to this church and this youth group. We, we have reminded them countless times. This youth group is not built on Aaron and Bree, nor does it end with Aaron and Bree. The youth group is built on the word of God and on Jesus Christ. And because of that, it will be eternal. And I, I told them this, um, and I'll tell you this. We got about two months with you. Let's make it the best two months ever. And I think the Lord's going to bless it. And we love you more than you know. And, and if you have anything you want to talk about, you got any questions about it, I'll, I'll, I'll give you whatever answers I have. Um, but y'all mean the world to us, and we love you very much. And we're thankful that the Lord allowed us to be here. And we're thrilled to see how the Lord continues to bless this church. told Aaron the other day it, uh, it feels like family's leaving yeah. it does it yeah. feels like family's leaving and uh, I, I want to say to him and Bree uh, not just uh, in a position to work alongside them but as a parent uh, I want to thank them for what they've invested in, in our son and I know many of you feel the same way about your kids and your grandkids and uh, I've had a I've had a bird's eye view uh, with my office where it is now at the number of kids that come in to, to counsel with them and, and to be encouraged by them. Um, but I do appreciate what Aaron said. Um, the same God that sent us Aaron and Bree will send us who we were supposed to have. And uh, as wonderful, that, and, it's, and, and it, was, it was amazing really what they, they did. It was amazing. And, and I, haven't even told, I haven't even told Aaron this, the other night, at the auction, a person approached me that attends probably the largest church in Tampa. And they were so impressed with Aaron and Bree, they said, I told my church about them. Ah. So we weren't going to keep <laughs> someone this good for, for a long period of time. I wish we would have kept them longer than we did. Can I get a witness? Um, but, but what God has given them the gift to do... Um, we have been blessed by that in many, many ways as a church. So we love them. We're going to miss them. We do need to rally around one another and pray that, that God will help uh, during the transition, uh, what's best for our kids, and that God will send us the next uh, couple that we need to be our, our youth pastor and that wife. And so let's give them another hand for what they mean to us and how much we love them. And... Uh, We've, we've been blessed that God has allowed our paths to cross. We really, we really, really have. So, um, and we appreciate the message tonight too, Aaron. And so we, we, we thank you. But the, these, are, these are tough things when it comes to ministry. God, God sends people. God moves people along. 
um, but but I want them to know what they what they mean to us as a church family. So, all right, thank you for coming this evening, and um, as we uh, begin this week, uh, like I said, it's called Holy Week. I pray that you'll be thinking about what the Lord Jesus did for us each and every day uh, as he made his way to the old rugged cross. Uh, Good Friday, well, Wednesday night service, hope you'll be here, and then we'll remind you again about Good Friday. Uh, There are cards, there were some taken, and we're glad of that today, but if you'll get some cards to hand out this week, we we would appreciate that as well. Any other announcements before it is missed? 9, 6, 30, Friday. 6 o'clock, yes, sir. 6 o'clock Friday night, yes. Yep. All right, anybody else? Um, that's, I don't, yeah, that's just informational, so, yeah. All right, appreciate you coming, and I uh, hope you have a great week. Remember those uh, that we mentioned uh, this morning. Yeah. Went, went and saw Eric this morning. Pray for Eric. Yeah. Ken and Rita, they're tired. They're yeah. tired, so let's try to encourage them. Uh, when I was there, they left, and, and Bob and Phyllis came to kind of relieve them. And so uh, let's, let's pray for Eric and their family. It's been a rough couple weeks. All right, let's be close in prayer. Brother Bill Blanchard, would you close us in prayer, please?